Good afternoon. Welcome to Grand Rounds. Uh, today, it's my pleasure to welcome back Dr. Patricia Quinlisk. Uh, Dr. Quinlisk holds an MD uh, degree from the University of Wisconsin, Masters of Public Health from Johns Hopkins, and from two th or I'm sorry, 1994 to 2018, she was the state epidemiologist uh, for the state of Iowa. Uh, currently, she is focusing her energies on the prevention of dementias and uh, cognitive decline. And uh, we're very pleased that she was able to accept our invitation today to present on exactly that topic. And please join me in virtually welcoming back Dr. Patricia Quinlisk. Thanks. Thank you very much. And thank you for having me again. This has become a, a topic that's sort of near and dear to my heart. Um, there is dementia on both sides of my family. In fact, my mother just died this spring with dementia. So it's a, an issue that even while I was still at the health department and primarily doing infectious diseases, um, I started thinking, wait a minute, here's a, a horrible problem. Can we prevent it? And um, the science is not real strong right now, but uh, people, researchers started looking at this probably about 10 to 15 years ago. Um, and the science every year gets stronger, that there is quite a bit we can do about it. But of course, with only 10 years experience and with a disease like dementia, um, it will probably be a while before we have really good, strong um, evidence. But right now with evident, uh, uh, observational studies and with some um, retrospective studies, um, there is a lot of good information coming out that we can probably do quite a bit to lower our individual risk and the risk in our communities of dementia. And any of you who have had to deal with dementia understand completely that dementia does not only affect the person, the patient, but of course can have significant uh, impact on their families, caregivers, friends, et cetera. So today I'm gonna to go through um, where the science is right now, and I'll try to sort of say this is harder science, it's a little bit softer. Um, but the one good thing about all the things that are coming out in preventing of dementia is they're also good, just good, healthy behaviors too. And therefore, um, will probably lower your risks of things like heart disease and cancers and all of those things too. There's nothing particularly unique in the things that are being um, found to lower your risk of dementia. So let me go to my slides and hopefully I did that right so you can all see my slides at this point. What I'd like to talk today is about how we can prevent Alzheimer's, dementia, and other cognitive declines, and sort of what those things are and what the progress um, we have in the science of, progress, of uh, preventing these uh, potentially devastating diseases. I like starting out with just talking about how much is this impacting our community? And if you look at the top 10 causes of death from 1990 um, and the last year that we can get um, information was just 2019, so about 20 years, you can see in 1990, um, uh, really Alzheimer's uh, or dementia, none of that was even in the top 10 causes of death. Today in the United States, Alzheimer's disease alone is the number six cause of death. Um, in fact, though, uh, in the UK in 2018, uh, dementia plus Alzheimer's, and I'll talk a little bit about the distinction between those two, uh, but um, dementia and Alzheimer's was accounting for almost 13% of all deaths registered and actually now um, is thought to be the number one cause of death of women in England. If we just look at... at um, here in Iowa, we know that we are a state that tends to have older people. So if you look at 2019, you'll see that Alzheimer's disease um, alone is number four. And actually, if you pull it out by gender, it's number three in, in women. Now, we only look at Alzheimer's disease here in Iowa. And Alzheimer's by far is the most common type of dementia we see. But it, it is only 70% of all dementias. Um, and as you probably know, most of Alzheimer's is diagnosed, uh, d definitively diagnosed after death. Um, so if we would add all of the dementias to Alzheimer's, it would be higher up on our cause of death. Um, so it, it's, it's a huge problem um, here in Iowa. So if we go back and we just sort of look at what's happened over the last 
50 years with diseases, we can see that we're making significant inroads in heart diseases. That's going down. Cardiovascular disease is going down. Some things are staying sort of equal, like unintentional injuries. But if you look at Alzheimer's disease, and I don't know if you can see my arrow here, but look at what Alzheimer's disease has done. It's just gone up and up and up and up. Um, and if you would add other dementias to this, it would be even higher. So again, even when we age adjust, um, it is still very significant. This is not just a phenomenon of we're all just living longer and you have to die of something. Um, even when you do age adjusted, um, we are seeing a significant rise in um, Alzheimer's disease and probably other types of dementia. So let's talk a little bit about what is dementia, what is cognitive impairment, and what is normal cognition. And I put this up just to, to remind everybody, all of these things are spectrums. It's not like there's a hard cutoff where you go from normal cognition to mild cognitive impairment or from mild cognitive impairment into dementia. All of these are sort of a, a, a spectrum where you start and you sort of go um, and see more and more maybe cognition problems. And at some point, you could be diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment and it goes along. And at some point, you can be diagnosed with dementia. Um, the way I think about this is that most of us who are out there in our communities working, certainly all of you in hospitals, have normal cognition. As we get older, or if you have brain injuries, you can have some mild cognitive impairment. Um, there may be certain things that you just don't do as well as you used to. Uh, remembering names quickly, um, uh, being able to drive around town and know all your directions well or whatever. But with mild cognitive impairment, you are still in your community, you are still being able to live in independently, you, you're still doing all right. Once you get into that dementia, basically you have so much impairment that you cannot live independently. You have to have somebody help you just walk through the normal daily activities. And certainly at that point, you're not going to have a, a normal job. But the bottom line is dementia or Alzheimer's disease or what they used to call senility is not a normal part of aging. It's just like having heart disease is not a normal part of aging. Um, th this is not normal, and again, I'm going to talk about what we can do to try to decrease the risk of having cognitive decline in dementia um, or Alzheimer's. So again, cognitive impairment is a progressive condition. Um, usually you start out with a few things, you get on, and then let me give you an example. Let's say you start having trouble remembering what you need to buy at the grocery store. You used to be able to remember all 20 things on your list when you walked in the grocery store. Now you have to have a piece of paper in your kitchen where you can write down what you need or you use um, your e iPhone or something, but you have to make a list. Otherwise you tend to forget something. Okay, that would be mild cognitive impairment, um, but you're still coping. You know how to adjust to it. You know how to make that one cognitive impairment work for you. Now, if you have had your whole life trouble remembering what to get at the grocery store, then that would not be an indication of, of progressive cognitive impairment. So you've always had trouble with that. Okay, so mild cognitive impairment may start noticing some changes in cognitive function. But you're still able to do your normal activities, though you might have to do um, things that help you adjust to your, you're not being able to do that thing or remember those things as well as you used to. Severe cognitive impairment, basically levels of impairment that can lead to losing your ability to understand the meaning or the importance or something, even to the point of ability to talk or write, um, resulting in the inability to live independently. Um, so I, I, I give my classes the the example of uh, when you have no cognitive impairment, you always remember where you where you left your car keys. If you have mild cognitive impairment, maybe you start noticing that you, you can't quite remember where you put it, so you put a hook by your door. So when you come in, you hook your keys up and then you always know where they are. Severe cognitive impairment would be you look at your car keys and you have no idea what they're used for. So how much cognitive impairment do we have here in Iowa? 
Well, approximately 9% of adults who are aged 50 years and older perceive themselves as having some type of cognitive impairment. So that's the person who used to be able to go to the grocery store, now has to write a list. Um, and there are about 20% of Iowa adults who are 18 years of age and older with perceived cognitive impairment who actually report that they have had to give up some type of household activity because of this cognitive impairment. Um, even when I write a list, I forget my list at home when I go to the grocery store, my husband's had to take over that job because I just don't do it well enough anymore. The bottom line for all of this though is what's at the bottom of the slide. 80% of the people who have noticed cognitive impairment have not talked to their healthcare provider about it. Why is that? Well, when my grandfather started getting senile, it was something to be ashamed of. It was something that you didn't want to admit to anybody outside your family. Um, and so I think that kind of stigma is still around. And of course we know people as they get older don't want to lose their independence and they're afraid if they say something about it, maybe somebody will take their car keys away or will tell them they have to go into assisted living. But I think this is something that, that we need to ask people about because there is something you can do about it, not only to help them cope with the cognitive impairment, but again, to perhaps um, reduce the risk of that progressing. And even scarier statistic is here in Iowa, 35% of those people who have memory problems live alone. This is an infographic that I just thought I'd show you that was put together by the Iowa Department of Public Health, the Alzheimer's Foundation, um, or the Alzheimer's Association and the Centers for Disease Control. Um, but this is for the data that was um, uh, obtained in 2015 from um, the BRFS, which is a system where they call people and ask them, have you had any trouble with this? So this is all self-reported data, but you look at that and you can see that people are, are um, saying I have subjective cognitive decline. And again, that is I've noticed that I'm not doing things as well as I used to. And this one says one in 11 people over 45 are experiencing this. Um, and then you get down 22% are needing help with household chores, 25% are having to give up some daily activities, et cetera. Um, and these are not good. We know that sometimes people when they have this cognitive impairment will start sequestering them away from family and friends because they don't want anybody to notice. And I'll just tell you, my mother for years didn't want to tell anybody that she was having trouble remembering. So if you asked her a question about anything really, she would start coughing and say, oh, oh, oh I, oh, I can't talk to you right now. I'm going to have to go get a glass of water. And she'd hang up. That was her way of, of thinking she was hiding the fact that she couldn't remember. And that's very common. So what are the risk factors for cognitive impairment? Well, there's some that we can't do anything about. We can't do anything about the fact that we get older. There is a gene called APOE E4, which does seem to be correlated with increased risk. But as I go through the rest of these slides, I'd like you to keep in mind that even people who have two of these genes, got one from mom and dad, have shown that all of these things that I'm gonna be talking about today actually um, will help those people too. In fact, some studies even show that people who have double doses of this gene can take their risk down to normal in their environment and, and normal healthy people reducing their risk of dementia. So this is not an absolute gene, it's more of a risk, but it's a risk that appears to be um, addressable. Uh, diabetes is a risk, smoking is a risk, um, poor diet, high blood pressure, cholesterol, lack of physical exercise, and lack of mental stimulations. Um, another one I put on here that I'll talk about um, later is poor hearing. Now, people talk, especially uh, recently, about, oh, we've got these drugs. Um, all I'll have to do is I'll take the magic pill and automatically my cognitive decline or my mother's Alzheimer's will go away and we'll be back to normal again. Um, I'll just tell you that there is no drug out there right now that will cure 
cognitive decline, dementia, or Alzheimer's. There are a few drugs that can slow the progression, um, but even those lose their efficacy after a period of time, maybe six months or a year. And even the new drug that just came out that everybody's so excited about, um, a lot of places have refused to use it because um, basically it's never been shown to help uh, with things like Alzheimer's and dementia. All it's really been helped, uh, shown to help is to reduce the amount of amyloid deposit in the brain. In fact, a lot of um, drug companies are stopping their research. Why? Because nothing seems to work. Um, when I've talked to people who understand a lot more about this than I do, my sense is that by the time you have Alzheimer's or dementia, the damage to the brain seems to be so uh, widespread, uh, et cetera, that probably there is no drug that will take the brain back to normal. Um, and so when you think about these things and all of these different drugs and things that people talk about, the answer is probably none of these really work. So there is probably no known uh, either treatment or cure for uh, cognitive decline, Alzheimer's, dementia. And again, look at places like Mayo Clinic. Yeah, there are some current Alzheimer's meds that can help for a time, but it's get the can help and for a limited amount of time. These are um, basically helping treat some symptoms. They are not meant to be uh, treatment or cures. So. This is the point of my talk, what does seem to work, and that is prevention. So we're going to go into people's lives and try to stop them from ever having the kind of damage to the brain that, that basically means the person has Alzheimer's or dementia. So current science indicates that individuals can reduce their risk of cognitive decline, excuse me, dementia, and Alzheimer's disease up to 70, maybe even some science says 75%. And they believe that right now with the science where it is, is at the current time, about 40% of all dementias in our communities can be prevented. So the main things about prevention are what I've got here. Eat well, get moving, stay sharp with your brain, be social, sleep enough, Address all chronic diseases like diabetes, high blood pressure. Reduce your sweat, stress. Make sure you heal, hear well. Avoid those meds that actually are bad for your brain and people of, of my age and older should not be taking. And then there's a couple other things that I'll talk about today. So I'm gonna start out with eat well. This is the one that probably has the most science behind it. Um, but again, I will not say that this is an absolute great study because most of the studies on uh, the MIND diet and good diets are only about five, maybe at most 10 years long. And obviously to, to look at things like dementia, we need to be following period for decades. But this is one um, that we know probably helps. And that's the MIND diet. It stands for the Mediterranean. And you all know the Mediterranean is just a good, healthy diet. The DASH diet, DASH in case you're not familiar with it, that is a hypertensive diet, mainly to lower sodium in the diet. So the Mediterranean DASH intervention for neurogenerative delay, and I just, that's one of those ones where they sat around the table trying desperately to make it spell out mind, but they, they got it. It was developed in um, the Rush University Medical Center, it was funded by the National Institute of Aging. They published it about five, six years ago. And they had followed almost a thousand people in Chicago over not quite five years, and about 144 of them did develop Alzheimer's. But the bottom line was the longer the people had followed this mind diet, the less risk they had appeared to have. In fact, um, those people who followed the mind diet moderately well seemed to have about a 35 percent lower risk than people who weren't on the MIND diet. And those people who followed it rigorously seem to have about a 53% less risk. Now I'll tell you, um, one of the problems with all of these studies, and this happens in most of science, is, is very seldom do you find people who do everything terrible except one thing really well, like eat well, but they sit on their couch all day, they watch you know, mindless TV or whatever. 
people who eat well usually are also doing other things that are healthy. So it's a little bit hard to pull these things apart. So you'll notice that a lot of times if you added up all of the percentages I'm going to tell you today, you'd be way over 100%. But the bottom line is people who followed a MIND diet, the Mediterranean and low-sodium diet, seem to do much better over a five-year period than those people who didn't. Since that time, they've done two more large studies and found significantly slower cognitive decline in people who ate at least two servings of vegetables a day. And the strongest effect seems to be seen with um, leafy green vegetables, especially dark leafy green or leafy dark green vegetables, um, such as spinach. Um, by the way, I'm going to go back. One of the things we do promote people eating lots of leafy green vegetables. Um, we do have people who are on things like Coumadin, Warfarin, um, and have been told not to eat leafy green vegetables. Um, the, the bottom line is um, nobody should significantly change their diet abruptly, uh, especially with things like this. But you can eat six servings of leafy green vegetables, even if you're on Coumadin, Warfarin, um, you just need to watch your uh, coagulation studies and adjust for that and, and then stay constant. So it's not an absolute that people cannot do something like this to lower their risk of dementia if they are on an anticoagulant. Okay, the next thing is to get moving. And we, we specifically don't call this exercise because a lot of people in their mind when you say exercise say, oh, that means I have to go to the gym, I have to put on black spandex shorts, and I have to sweat. Well, no. They found that even mild physical activity, such as walking, is associated with decreased risk of cognitive impairment. In fact, they've even some studies have shown that people who have mild cognitive function can even reverse some of that with movement. But the movement, this exercise must be regular. In other words, you can't just sit on the couch for six days a week and then go play basketball for three hours on Saturday. No, that, that doesn't, the science says that doesn't seem to work very well. So it must be regular and it should tend towards being more vigorous, meaning that you get your heart rate up and you have a little bit of, of increase in your breathing rate. But all of these studies looked at various different things and the bottom line is having somebody just walk uh, from, say right now, they walk 2000 steps a day up to 4,000 steps a day can make a significant difference in their risk for dementia. The CDC guidelines right now is to move for 30 minutes, three or more times a week. And that's where I would at least try to start with most of the patients. Um, but it can be just walking around the block or uh, taking their dog for a walk or dancing or bike riding. It doesn't have to be, again, sweating heavily at the gym with spandex on. So if you do vigorous activity, and this is um, basically vigorous is defined as you're getting to the point where it's hard to say a complete sentence. You're only able to get a few words out at a time. But if you do vigorous exercise or activity for one to two times a week, it appears that your risk of dementia can go down by about 30 to 40 percent. Now, if you do it three or more times a week, it gets better, 35 to 50 percent risk reduction. Uh, but this is vigorous activity. And for some people, that level of activity um, is not as doable. Moderate activity can give you a very significant risk reduction also. Moderate would be you're, you're having to breathe hard, but you're not to the point of gasping out phrases, and that's all you can do, which would be vigorous. Okay. The next one is sort of what I call it the use it or lose it, the stay sharp. People need to continue mental engagement and cognitive training of some kind. This seems to improve immediate and delayed recall, in other words, memory. Um, and we, you all know, you know, people who continue to work until their 90s do better than the person who at 60 stops working, goes home, sits at home at the couch, and never does another thing with their brain for the rest of their life. So, we know that keeping the brain um, working is incredibly important. Now, when they do these studies, they have found that things like doing a crossword puzzle every day, well, that that's not bad for you, but it, it's not probably going to be as good as a lot of other things. 
So the ones that they've looked at are, are things that are hard, that take time, and that you have to use. So the ones they've looked at uh, in a lot of these studies is things like learning a new language. That seems to take a lot of brain en energy. And I'll just tell you from somebody who, who's, had to tr who's tried to learn a new language, that's hard. But if you do learn it, of course, you, you use it. Another one is learning a new skill, such as learning to play a new musical instrument, but it could be something like learning how to watercolor, learn how to do carpentry, uh, taking a college class. But if you do that, you don't just audit it. You have to use it. So you have to write the papers and take the tests, things like that. But you can see all of these are things that you know, are hard. These are not easy things. But to be honest, you all know in your everyday life, you're probably doing these things all the time, learning something new, reading journals, learning new medicine uh, things. So learning these things and keeping your mind sharp is very important. In fact, um, compared to somebody who basically doesn't use their brain at all, you can decrease your risk somewhere around 47 to 63%. And I like this quote, the mind is like a muscle. The more you exercise it, the stronger it will get and the more it can expand. Next being social. This science is not as, as hardcore, um, but it seems to be very, very important. If we look at people who are incredibly lonely, and so I'm talking about, oh, the, the, the old man who lives in an apartment all by himself, never talks to anybody, doesn't have any family or friend, um, et cetera, that person is at extraordinary high risk for developing dementia. There is something about interacting with other people that is very important for our brains. So if you are if you have a patient who sits in their apartment all day long by themselves for years at a time, they're actually, their risk of dementia can go up by 60%. We know that interacting with others often can cause a, about a 50% decreased risk of cognitive decline when compared to those who are not socially active. Now we know that each person has a difference in what they feel comfortable with being socially active. There are gregarious people and we have introverts. But we do try to ask people or, or to tell people to have about five to six social ties. And we like people to have social ties in three different layer, layers. Uh, basically, number one layer is you've got somebody who's such a close friend or family member that at three o'clock in the morning when something goes wrong, you can call them and they're going to be at their, your door as, as fast as they can get there. So sort of that emergency three o'clock in the morning, I can call and, and they're going to be there to help me. The second layer of, of the social uh, guidelines would be the ones that we usually think about, our, our friends, the, the person you call up who loves to go to um, rom-com movies. So your friend that goes to movies, maybe it's your friend who loves ethnic food and you go out to dinner or the guy down the road that you like to go walk your dogs together. Those are the people in this middle group. You know them, they're your friends. You do things with them a couple times a month. The lowest level, which is a level we usually don't think about. And um, there, there's actually a book written about it. It's called Consequential Strangers. These are people we don't know very well. We may not even know their name, but we recognize them. So it could be the lady down the, wall, the street that you walk past who's always out in her garden and you say hi and how's your kids doing or whatever. Or it could be the, the guy who makes your, your coffee at the coffee shop or, you know, just whoever. But it's people that recognize you, you recognize them, you stop and chat for a minute, but you really don't know them that well. Those are consequential strangers and those seem to be critically important for you to feel like you belong in your community and this is indeed your community. When you move and don't know anybody, one of the things that happens is you feel that you don't know those people and you lose those ties. And that's one of the reasons why moving sometimes can be uncomfortable. Now I'm going to talk for just a second about being able to hear well. Um, the Lancet put together a commission to look at dementia risk. In fact, at the end, I'll, I'll give you the link to it. You can get it off the internet. And they defined hearing impairment as the most easily modifiable risk factor for dementia. 
They, they say, and of course this is in the British Isles, but they believe that about 8% of all dementia risk in their community is due to hearing loss, which is huge, to be honest. And this risk was only associated with the worst cognition with those people who were not using hearing aids. So it wasn't so much the loss of hearing, um, you know, the pathological loss of hearing, it was the not being able to hear. If they had loss of hearing but used hearing aids, their risk went back up to normal. Now, the, how much of a risk is there? Well, they uh, felt that the increase of risk for an individual was about a, uh, by, got worse by about a third for every decibel of worsening hear lo loss. But hearing aids got rid of that risk. So right now we are recommending that every person, especially when they get older, though the national recommendation is 12 years of age and older, everybody should get hearing tests regularly. And if their hearing is not normal, they should get a hearing aid and wear it. Um, so I'll just say my grandmother had a hearing aid, refused to, to wear it. Um, but it's just, they need to wear it because there's something about hearing stimulating your brain that's important. And of course, for social interactions and for using your brain, listening to books or uh, courses or music, you need to be able to hear well. I thought I'd take just a minute also and talk about medications. There are a whole group of medications. I'm not going to go through all of these, but there are a lot of medications, especially the anticholinergic medications, that are particularly bad for the, for the old brain. Um, we know that we need the, the cholinergic uh, connections in our brains for things like memory. And to give people anticholinergic drugs actually can... Um, greatly impair that, especially if it's taken um, at higher doses and over a long period of time. So I would just suggest um, anybody who's got older people on some of these medications, you might want to work with your pharmacist or look in the literature and see if there's something that might be as effective or maybe a lower dose or something, because these are not good medicines for older people. Now, obviously, people have medical problems for which they may need these, but again, just be aware that these are a problem and do indeed re increase your risk of cognitive impairment and dementia. But there are also over-the-counter meds that can be bad. Uh, Benadryl probably is the number one out there, but most people who take things like Tylenol PM may not even realize it's got diphenhydramine or Benadryl in it. And then, of course, there's the heartburn medicines, Pepsid, Zantac. I mean, you see those on TV all the time. And then a lot of, of the anti-allergy medicines. Um, so just um, be aware of this. And if you have a patient comes in saying, I'm, I'm starting to have trouble with my memory, I, one of the first things I do is look and see if I've got my patient on one of these drugs and maybe I need to change the drugs. But there are all other risk factors. Obviously, if anybody is smoking, they need to stop. Sleeping is critically important. You know, it's, it's become like almost the catchphrase for just about everything um, can be made worse in your life, your heart disease, um, uh, cognition, all sorts of things, if you're not getting good sleep. Um, we've had people come to us that are only sleeping an hour or two at night. Well, obviously, that's going to really severely impact your brain function. So we do want people to work on, on sleep. And then good control of chronic diseases. And the two that seem to be especially important for uh, brain health is blood pressure and diabetes. And then just reducing stress. And as we're going into a, a whole day of heat advisory, hydration is incredibly important. But of course, we're also dealing with people who have trouble with urinary incontinence or um, so various things, getting up at night, having to go to the bathroom, et cetera. So this becomes um, a discussion about how to do it in a way that is good for their brain, but does not then impact their sleep, for example. So what I thought I'd do is, is tell you that we have put together a quiz. Um, out, right now it's being updated, so give us another week to two weeks. But you can have your patients take this quiz. It's on the Iowa Department of Public Health's website. They take the quiz and they can find out what things they're not doing 
um, maybe as well as they could. So it helps them identify the issues in their life and it will give them a score. Now I'll just tell you that score is, we try to make it as, as consistent with the science as, as we could right now, but it is basically um, a score to then watch a trend, to take the, the quiz, start trying to change some behaviors and maybe three months later, take the quiz again and see if you've increased your score. Um, but it's available. Anybody can take it. It's on the website and um, you can actually print it out at the end so they can bring back to you um, what they, they took uh, and their score and you could talk to them about the things they could change or whatever, or they could just um, close it out and, and the IDPH does not keep track of anybody's data. It's gone the minute you close out the quiz. The other thing that we're doing um, here in Des Moines and in Atlantic, Mason City, Marshalltown, and Forest City is we're having um, classes on how to, called Saving Your Brain and Your Body, and where we teach people about all of these things, and then we do behavior modification to help them actually make the changes. So we go through goal setting using SMART goals. We have individual consultations with a registered dietitian, a geriatric pharmacist goes through all their meds with them. They are put, a uh, fitness plan is put together for them depending upon um, where they are right now and what they need the most help in. And we also do things like balance that are important for older people. They have a health coach who goes through stress and sleep. They also get a, a membership to the Y. Um, and it's a, a 10 week program that then has monthly sessions for, well, as long as we've been doing it um, to keep people working on these uh, behavior changes and to continue to giving them support to make those changes. Um, so if you have anybody who's interested in this, um, they can call the Wellmark Y downtown here in Des Moines, and they're taking registration. We do not have one up in Ames, though. Um, I would love to talk to people up there about getting one going next year. We also have a website called savingyourbrain.org where we just have a lot of information. Mainly it's meant for the public um, just to pull out, uh, like there's a tool uh, that you can put on your refrigerator door and you check off every time you eat your leafy green vegetables and your um, well, your fruits and your whole grains. And then you check off where it's got red about how many times you eat red meat, which you shouldn't eat more than three times a week. So there's a lot of things available on here. And there's also, as I said, a risk assessment quiz on the Iowa Department of Public Health website. I just, before I finished, I was gonna show you, this is the World Health Organization guidelines. You can get this online. Um, and basically they are much in step with everything I've just said about trying to risk, uh, reduce your risk of cognitive decline and dementia. Then here is the Lancet report. They just came out a year ago with an updated report. Um, and you can go through it and it talks about all of the different things and what their, um, uh, I identified how much risk they believe with each factor, though, again, they're in the same place we are in that um, the science is not as strong as we would like it to be in some of these areas, primarily just because we haven't had long enough to look at it. Um, here's just some references. Uh, if you're interested, you can go to and look at these. Um, and then I put in here um, both references that are medical sort of scientific studies but then also you can see at the bottom in each one of these areas, there's articles that can be used if you want to hand them out to your patients. These are good quality articles that refer back to these studies, but are a lot easier to read by somebody who's not um, in science. Um, and so there's ones on the mind diet and other kinds of Mediterranean diet. This is one um, on exercise and movement. And it just talks about walking and exercise may age, aid the aging brain and, and things like that. So it's just a way of, if you're interested in getting things to your patients, here's ones on um, social engagement, um, using your brain, staying sharp, um, and then stress, sleep, hearing, um, et cetera. And then I threw in just some other ones um, about uh, things. And my favorite, of course, is that dark chocolate is actually really good for your brain because that's my favorite thing to eat when I'm hungry for something that uh, is somewhat sweet. So anyway, uh, those are all in there. And again, here's just some national resources, the Healthy Aging with Health and Human Services, the National Institute on Aging, et cetera. 
So I put in a lot of things if you're interested, but bottom line, for those of you who are Star Trek fans, we all need to live long and prosper. So that is the end of my talk, and I will see if I can get back to uh, me. I think I should be able to. There we go. And if there's any comments or um, questions or whatever, I'm, I'm glad to help out however I can. Yeah, we have one question. Any advice on alcohol? Okay, alcohol is actually a, a little bit tricky. When the Mediterranean diet first came out, of course, they, they were promoting maybe a glass or two of red wine per night. Um, but, of course, the, the national guidelines are once you hit 65, um, no more than one uh, serving of alcohol per day for less than seven days a week. So basically, you're talking about one glass of wine, maybe six nights a week. And that's for men and women. After 65, they do not make a distinction between men and women, whereas they do before. They say one glass for women, two glasses for men. But there's a lot more science that have come out now, primarily out of places like England, where they have, of course, the massive databases and they're finding that alcohol um, has obviously correlation with a lot of other diseases that may not be um, as good cancers, for example. Um, so, but of course, most of that's to do with binge drinking or excessive drinking. What I tell the people in our class is if you drink alcohol right now, it's okay but don't drink more than one drink a night. And if you're going to drink anything, red wine probably is still the best thing for you. But if you do not drink, do not start drinking because there's not good enough evidence to suggest that drinking is, is good enough for you to start drinking and then take on the risk of maybe at some point you start over drinking. So don't start if you don't drink. If you do drink, no more than one glass a night. And I would not be surprised if at some point in the future that might change a bit. I saw an article, or excuse me, a study about six months ago su suggesting that all of the good benefits of alcohol that have been seen in these studies really are good benefits to older men who have heart disease. Once you take older men with heart disease out, alcohol has no beneficial effect on the rest of the people in the study. So we might be seeing more about that in the near future. Okay, and I got a question about anti-cholesterol meds such as statins. Can they be a risk for dementia? And this is being looked at. And there are people out there who think that this may be a risk because, of course, you need cholesterol in your brain. Um, in fact, that's one of the most important chemicals you have in your brain. And there have been some not really long-term studies saying that the um, – statins may actually increase your risk of dementia. But those are very, very weak. They don't have a lot of people in them. They've not been looking at it for very long. And we know, of course, that if you don't have a good heart, you're not gonna have a good brain. Um, so I guess my recommendation would be, if you use statins, um, or if the person needs statins, go ahead and use them. Try to use the minimal dose that, that achieves the effect you want for the heart health or whatever. Um, and then just um, make the person aware that they should tell you if they start seeing some cognitive decline. Because maybe at that point a new drug has come out that might help with the cholesterol but won't have as much of a brain effect. Um, but this is being looked at right now, and I think we'll probably hear some more definitive answers in the next couple of years. One more question. Uh, some people think that fat is good for the brain. So how about that? You're talking about dietary fat, I assume. That's but what anyway, I... Um, well, the, the bottom line is anything that's bad for the heart is going to be bad for the brain. Um, if you look at the MIND diet, basically they say go to olive oil or another vegetable oil that's very low in saturated fats um, as your primary oil in your diet. Um, so that if you really like the taste of butter, okay, but use it as a flavoring. Do not use it as the thing that you cook everything in. Um, so we try very hard to get people to switch over to olive oil. I'll tell you one of the things that a lot of people in our classes find is the flavored olive oils help. They may not like the taste of olive oil, and I'll be honest, I 
taste of olive oil sort of, mm, I don't like that much either. But you can buy flavored olive oils that then impart a, a flavor that maybe you like into the food that you're cooking. And there's a lot of stores you can go to where you can taste all the different olive oils and see which one you like. Um, and that helps people sort of convert from, say, a butter to an olive oil. But, um, yeah, we don't, you know, lard, um, you know, animal fats, et cetera, really don't seem to be good for the brain. But, of course, we need some oils in our diet. So we do say the olive oil, the, the low, uh, low saturated fat uh, vegetable oils. That's the last question we have so far. Okay. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. Um, I don't know that there's anything else that I haven't um, covered that I'd like to, to say anything about. Just, um, you know, the, the thing that we find mostly is that people really would like to have, oh, well, if I just do this one thing, then, then I'll be good. Well, just like heart disease and anything else, there isn't just one thing you can do that's going to give you a perfect brain. It's, it's all about basically healthy living with a few things that maybe you didn't think about, like keeping your brain sharp and things like that. But um, we, we've done this program now, though, Saving Your Brain, for two years. We've had people get off high blood pressure medicines. Now, that's probably just because of the good diet and the low salt diet. We've had people get off anti-anxiety and anti-depression medicines because, right, because they're exercising and socializing and all that stuff. But we've had quite a bit of anecdotal reports to us that, that their, um, their chronic diseases or chronic conditions get better. But I would say pretty much 100% of our classes say at the end of class, I feel better, which of course you would hope they would after getting their diet better and exercising and you know, socializing and using their brain, et cetera. Um, so thus far, though, I can't tell you whether the class we do is really decreasing the amount of dementia. And we just, we've only been doing it for two years. We don't have uh, data on that. Um, we're hoping it does, and we think it does, but I, we, we don't have data to prove it. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, thank you for having me. <laughs>